We're ready to, to kick off. Huh? All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Sabre uh, Ballparks Committee first ever Zoom meeting. Uh, my name is Kevin Johnson. I'm the co-chairman of the Sabre Ballparks Committee, along with uh, Ron Selter, who is the other co-chairman and uh, is probably on here somewhere. Uh, but uh, I want to thank uh, thank Richard Smiley for setting this up, and I think also uh, Brian Frank and maybe some other people. Uh, they got this all set up and ready to go. Uh, the committee, uh, as most of you probably know, uh, has to do with all different things ballpark related. Uh, we uh, try to have, uh, we had so, a big project, uh, the Green Cathedrals update that updated uh, less than two years ago, I guess. Uh, we have kind of an ongoing project that uh, kind of has some spurts and stops called the uh, Sabre Minor League database. Uh, always looking for some contributors to uh, move that forward. Uh, and we're also looking for some other ideas from people. Uh, we, we have a lot of people who contribute to the uh, Sabre uh, biographical uh, project, uh, writing up uh, ballpark bios. Uh, and, and again, we're, we're looking for uh, any suggestions. If, if you have some, uh, please send those to one of the uh, chairmen. Uh, either a, a book idea or a, a, another project. And, and we also have a newsletter that comes out uh, at least twice a year. Uh, I think it generally would be coming out again next uh, around the convention time, but uh, uh, this year, I, I don't know, <laughs> we'll see. Uh, but there'll be another one, come out soon. All right, and with all that, I'm going to uh, turn it back over and the let I think Richard's going to introduce our guest. Yeah, and I'm Richard Smiley. I'm the newsletter editor. And uh, what I just wanted to mention is if you have a, uh, a push plug for the newsletter, it does, as Kevin mentioned, it comes out twice a year. I've been publishing it in June and December. And so if you have anything that you think is related to ballparks that you want to get published that you might find of interest, check out our newsletter and see we, you know, the information's in there. I think you really enjoy it. Uh, so onward, uh, I'm here to introduce uh, Brian Frank, who is our featured speaker. Uh, a shout out to Bill Nolan, who suggested to me that uh, Brian would be a good person to have on this meeting. And so um, I, was able to uh, contact Brian kind of through that, through uh, Bill Nolan suggested it, and that's how I tracked him down. My interest in the meeting was mainly about the fact that last year uh, we had two new ballparks join the major league fold. We had uh, the, obviously the, the field in Texas, which uh, was prominently featured in uh, the World Series. Uh, but also we had a new major league ballpark in Buffalo where major league ball hadn't been played in, uh, you know, since 1915, uh, Brian could tell you more about that, but this was uh, as a result of the pandemic. And so I, and I know there was a process because it was a minor league ballpark and they had to do upgrades and they had to do changes. And so I was looking for somebody who, uh, could tell us about that process and the ballpark in general. And uh, I'm very happy that we were able to get Brian to do this. So uh, thank you, Brian. And without further ado, I'm gonna let you take it over from here. So. Yeah, thank you very much. I really appreciate you asking me here today. Um, I just wanna share, is there a way for me to share my screen with you guys? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's gonna be, that's Bill. Bill, can you make sure? Yeah, I, got, I have it now, thank you. Okay. It might just take me just a second here. And can you see my uh, PowerPoint right now? Yes. Okay, good. Um, yes, as Rich was saying, my name is Brian Frank and I uh, run a website, The Herd Chronicles, which is dedicated to preserving the history of the Buffalo Bisons and professional baseball in Buffalo. And uh, I grew up a Blue Jays fan as well as a Bisons fan. So 
Last summer was a, a dream come true for me. Uh, I was lucky enough to uh, be able to go to most of the games uh, to help uh, chronicle it for a, a, as a historian. And uh, I took a lot of pictures, uh, some of which you're gonna see today. And I'm really happy to be here to share it with you. Um, the focus of my presentation is the transformation of Salem Field and, and how the Blue Jays brought it up to be a, a major league facility. Um, but because it is the return of major league baseball to Buffalo, I thought I would start off by talking a little bit about uh, the major league teams that have played in Buffalo before. And that starts off with the National League Buffalo Bisons who uh, played in Buffalo from 1879 to 1885. And they were actually a fairly successful team. Um, the National League was only eight teams at the time and Buffalo finished third four times. So, you know, they didn't win any pennants, but not too bad finishing third. But the thing that really stands out about those teams to me, looking back on them, is how many future Hall of Famers they had on their teams. Um, starting with uh, James Pud Galvin, who was uh, their pitcher. And uh, he was the first pitcher to win 300 games in the major leagues. Uh, he ended up winning 363 games and 218 of those came with Buffalo. So that was the bulk of his career. He also threw two no hitters with the Bisons. Another future Hall of Famer on that team was Dan Bruthers. Uh, he ended up, he was one of the best sluggers, best hitters of the 19th century. I'm sure a lot of people are aware of both these guys. He won four National League batting titles. Two of them are with Buffalo. Deacon White, who's also a Hall of Famer now, um, played five seasons with Buffalo and hit 301. So not only did Buffalo have a lot of Hall of Famers at the time, but they were really Hall of Famers in, the, in their prime, really. Jim O'Rourke was a player manager uh, for four seasons, and he won the 1884, or led the league in batting average in 1884 with the Bisons. And finally, uh, a player that a lot of people don't realize actually played for Buffalo was old Haas Radborn, who of course uh, is known today as winning 60 games with the Providence Grays in 1884. But he, uh, Buffalo signed him as a pitcher to be Galvin's kind of second pitcher. And uh, he injured his arm in the spring and wasn't able to pitch. So he played six games for Buffalo at second base and right field. And because he couldn't pitch, they ended up releasing him. Um, and, you know, it would have been interesting to see what Galvin and Radborn could have done over their career, but to pitching together, but we'll never know. Buffalo also had a team in the Players League in 1890. That team uh, was not as successful on the field as the National League Club. In fact, they were horrendous, really. They finished 36 and 96, 46 and a half games out of first place. But they did have a couple of notable players. Um, on the left there, you see a young Connie Mack, who obviously would go on to make his name in the game. Uh, he was their catcher and was also an investor in the team because the players league, the players own the team. Um, he, he had 266 for Buffalo. And then William Hoy was their center fielder, and he was the first deaf um, mute player in the major leagues. Buffalo also had a team in the Federal League, which only lasted for two seasons, uh, the league that is. Um, th they were pretty successful their first year. They went 80 and 71 and finished in fourth place. And the next year, they were a couple or four games under 500. Uh, their probably most two notable players would be Hal Chase, who uh, hit 347 in 1914 and then led the league in home runs in 1915 by hitting 17. And he's actually pictured there in his Buffalo uniform. And then Russ Ford on the right was an Emery ball pitcher who went 21 and six with a 1.82 ERA in 1914 for Buffalo. And that, and that team was known as, the, in their first season, they were known as the Buffalo Federals or the Buffets. And then in the second season, they adopted the name, the Buffalo Blues. These are the box scores from when the Blue Jays came here. These were believed to be the last major league games played in Buffalo. September 8, 1915, the Buffalo Blues of the Federal League playing against the Baltimore Terrapins. And uh, Buffalo 
uh, swept that doubleheader. And again, the last major league game until the, the Blue Jays came here. However, over the summer, as we know, uh, there was an announcement that uh, major or a lot of Negro League games from 1920 to 1948 would be considered as major league. So that might change things a little bit. Buffalo had a lot of Negro. They, they didn't have a Negro League team in, in the leagues that will be considered major league during that time. But they did have a lot of games from uh, teams coming in and, and playing at Offerman Stadium in Buffalo during that time. The Cleveland Buckeyes, who are pictured here, came in quite often in the uh, mid to late 40s. And the, the last game in that time frame that I could find in 1948 that might be considered major league would be uh, the one that this little article is about right here, the Cleveland Buckeyes against the Chicago American Giants on September 8th, 1948, which is kind of weird because that's 33 years to the day after the Buffalo Blues last game here. Would, it, would have been the last. And this was a, a Negro American League game. And I, uh, as far as I know, it counted in the standings. So I believe this will be uh, counted as a major league game as well. But of course, as I'm sure most people know, Buffalo for, for the most part has been a, a proud minor league city. Um, this is a picture of a banner that hangs in, at Salem Field out in left field when the Bisons are playing that honors all the championship teams of, of uh, from Buffalo's history. Uh, for the most part, the Bisons have been a part of the International League and all its different incarnations over time. Uh, we were in the American Association during the late 80s and during the 1990s in the Eastern League for a time, but for most of the last 140 years, we've been a part of the International League. That brings us to Salem Field that we're here to talk about today and the return of Major League Baseball to Buffalo. When it was originally built, it was known as Pilot Field and it first opened in 1988. Um, it was really the first kind of retro ballpark. If you think of like the cookie cutter ballparks from like the 1970s and then you kind of think of like the, the renaissance of the retro parks from Camden Yards and some of the parks that came after that. Uh, Pilot Field was actually built four year or opened four years before Camden Yards opened. And it was uh, designed by the same architectural firm that designed Camden Yards and a lot of those retro parks that came after it. And uh, this photo I'm actually just noticing right now is a, is a really good photo to see how it, it, it's kind of built right downtown but among a lot of historical buildings in Buffalo. Um, the old post office is a, is a really grand design building on the right there and the Ellicott Square building right behind home plate, uh, very ornate buildings. It was built right down there. And it was really uh, part of a plan to try to lure a major league expansion, get a major league expansion franchise in Buffalo in the early nineties. Um, unfortunately, uh, in 1991, uh, Major League Baseball announced that the expansion teams would be going to Denver and Miami and not Buffalo, but the stadium was designed to bring a Major League team here. It seated 19,500 when it opened, but it was designed so that you could put an upper deck on top, and then what is the upper deck there now would become the mezzanine. And uh, if we got a, a major league team, they were going to add the upper deck and then it would have seated 41,000 people. But um, alas, we didn't get the, the expansion team. And ironically, though, a team would kind of fall into our lap in 2020 um, when we least expected it. Today, the stadium seats 16,600 for a variety of reasons. Uh, the bleachers out in uh, right field aren't there anymore. They, they put in like a party deck. There's another kind of uh, party zone restaurant kind of thing on the first baseline. And they've added in wider uh, seats behind home plate. So the, it doesn't seat as many now as when it first opened. But, and that's a more recent picture of it there now. Uh, the ballpark has had many highlights over the years. I could put together a, a whole PowerPoint 
about the highlights, but uh, some that stand out. When it first opened, uh, it was sold out just about every night. It was the kind of thing where you had to buy. I, I remember I was in high school at the time, like buying tickets before the season started for games because it was such a hot ticket. And uh, the Bisons drew over a million fans um, six times. Also won the, the 1997 uh, American Association Championship and a pair of Governor's Cup Championships. And again, they, so many highlights over the years. They've hosted a couple of AAA All-Star games, including the first one. Um, Bartolo Colon threw a no-hitter there in 1997. But I think uh, when, you're, when you're thinking of it from a ballpark committee perspective, certainly the, the attendance really jumps out at you when they first started. This is a photo of a, a sign that was on the 190, which is the highway that, that comes into Buffalo uh, right after the Blue Jays were announced that they'd be coming here in 2020. Uh, the Bisons have been the Blue Jays AAA affiliate since 2013. Um, and this year, or 2020 last year, was really a roller coaster ride for local baseball fans here because first, the minor league season was postponed because of the pandemic, but we still were hopeful that we'd get games at some point. Then on June 30th, the minor league season was canceled. Shortly after that, on July 18th, the Canadian government denied the Blue Jays permission to play in Canada because they didn't want teams crossing the border. That was six days before the major league season started that the Blue Jays were denied permission into Canada. So the team executives kind of had to scramble to find a place for the Blue Jays to play for the season. Uh, the first idea that really looked like it might work out for them was Pittsburgh. The Pirates agreed to share the facility with them, but the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health uh, didn't, didn't approve the idea, so they, they couldn't go to Pittsburgh. Then they looked at Baltimore, and uh, reports were that they came to an agreement with the Orioles that they could share that stadium, but with time growing short, they didn't want to wait for the Maryland government and see if they would approve it or not. So on July 24th, the day that the major league season started, they announced that they'd be coming to Buffalo. Uh, the Blue Jays opened up in Tampa and had some road games to start the season, but it was the day the season started. 18 days later, the Blue Jays were playing at Salem Field. So all the, um, changes that I'm going to show you in this presentation all took place in 18 days, which is really re remarkable. These are some photos that I took over the years of uh, some of the Bisons players, all of all the ones pictured here up on the Blue Jays now. And there's really so many more. The Blue Jays have such a young core right now with Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Bo Bichette and Kevin Biggio, and the list goes on and on. And all these guys were on the Blue Jays last year too. So they were all familiar with Salem Field and what it looked like before, and then what it looked like after the Blue Jays transformed it. And it's, it was kind of neat having so many uh, homegrown players there last year as well. This quote really, uh, I really like this one from TJ Zoik, who's a, a pitcher for the Blue Jays. He started the year at the Blue Jays alternate site in Rochester where a lot of the minor league players were and came up about probably about halfway through the season. And uh, he said, it's completely new, it's ridiculous. I thought I had a pretty good bearing on this place last year and then I got here and everything is so different. Um, I'm still trying to figure it out, out where everything is. It's a maze back here, but they did a tremendous job turning it into a big league clubhouse and really making everything exceptional. And really, so many of the uh, Blue Jays players were that had played here before were so complimentary because they saw the, the major transformation that had happened at the stadium. The picture on the left here is when the, the Bisons are playing there. The picture on the right is uh, the Blue Jays, of course. And I think the one thing that stands out to me in this picture is just the, in the Blue Jays picture, it's all the Canadian uh, companies being advertised out on, on the outfield wall, a lot of them. Um, what, one thing when you go through these like before and after pictures I'm about to show that really stand out, one is the Blue Jays were kind of um, updating a, a 
a stadium that seems new to me because I, I was here in Oakland, but it's 32 years old now. So there were a lot of things that could be updated um, and really bringing it up to major league specifications. Um, and also, and this is a really big thing is the making it so that players could socially distance during the pandemic, um, trying to take, make use of every inch of the ballpark really, uh, and even expanding it so that uh, players could socially distance during, during the pandemic. And you'll see that kind of as a theme as I go through here. Even the outside of the stadium, uh, all the signage was changed to Blue Jays and home of the Blue Jays. Uh, the picture on the right is uh, the Swan Street Gate, which is the main entrance when the fans are there. And uh, that was used as a media entrance during this time. This is, these before and after pictures here are um, from the Toronto Blue Jays. They put out these photos, uh, I think it was about the day before the first game here to show a lot of the changes that they'd made. And they really do a really good job of showing what it was before they started the work and after. This is the entrance. Uh, you, you come in the doors here and then you get on the elevator to go up to the pub at the park normally, which is the main restaurant at the stadium. But when the uh, Blue Jays were here, uh, you can see even the elevators get the Blue Jays logos on them. And this was the player's entrance where they would come in and uh, before and after every game. The, If you got on the elevators and went down to the field level, this is where you would get off. And you can see again, Bison's logo is gone. The Blue Jays logos are all there. But even with this picture, even the, the ceiling is different. And, and obviously the floor, the rug. So you can kind of see the, the care that they took to really transform the aesthetics of everything from the elevators to the ceiling. Again, this is, is a hallway down on the field level where the, where the players would have been to get to the home clubhouse. And you can see that from the floors to the paintings on the wall. This uh, really shows, again, making it so that people could be more socially distanced and giving more room. Uh, a room that had been a meeting room for the home clubhouse was made into Charlie Montoya, the Blue Jay manager's office, complete with, with his conga drums that he enjoys to play to relax there. Um, the, I think the main reason for this was the former manager's office was uh, kind of small. So this is just giving like more room in there for Charlie and his staff to be able to meet. The home locker room, or the Bisons was turned into the coach's locker room. Again, before you would have had, you know, 25 to 30 players in there. Now you're cutting back and, and making it just for the coaches. So you're able to spread, you can see how the lockers are spread out more there for social distancing. And again, all the improvements with the new carpeting and everything in there. What was the Visitor's locker room became a stretching area. This uh, really remarkable here, uh, kind of the hall, large hallway, which had been for batting cages was what they transformed into the player's locker room so that they, for the Blue Jays, the home player's locker room so that they could spread out more than they could have if they'd use the former locker rooms. So really social distancing, you can see that theme in every one of these. The home weight room became the home trainer's room. This picture I think really kind of shows the, the wear and tear of 32 years here on the left. Um, this would have been a tunnel to the visiting dugout you can see what they did with it on the right. Um, the Bison's home dugout is always on the first base side of the field. At the Rogers Center, the Blue Jays are always on the third base side. So 
they changed the home dugout at Salem Field over to the third base side so that it would be like it is at the Rogers Center. So what had been the visitor's dugout became the home dugout. And there you can see the former visitor's dugout on the third base side, now the home dugout. Uh, the other thing that'll stand out, especially when we look at the inside of the ballpark here, is uh, the color of the ballpark before had been green, the dugouts, the a lot of the seats. Uh, the original seats were red, but they're changing them over to green now. Uh, and you'll see that blue really kind of takes over when the Blue Jays come in here, as you can see in this picture. So visiting dugout becomes the home dugout. And you can see the green to the blue. This is the uh, bullpen down the third baseline, which had been the visiting bullpen, but it's now the home bullpen. Uh, one thing that the Blue Jays wanted to do was you can see that the uh, bullpen mound is on the field here as it was at so many stadiums back in the 80s. Uh, now, uh, I, I think Tampa might have their, their mound on the field, but most uh, major league stadiums don't have the mound on the field anymore. So the Blue Jays wanted to move that mound, but in the 18 day time period that they have, they just didn't have the time to do it or the space really, there really wasn't a good place for them to move the bullpen and the bullpen mound. So they kept it there, but what they did do on the right, you can see is they built an auxiliary bullpen um, with the, the canopy up there where the players could spread out more rather than just sitting on a bench down the line like they normally would. This is the concourse of the stadium. And this would be of course where the fans would uh, go out to buy snacks during a Bison's game or hot dog, whatever, use the restroom, come in and out from their sections. Because there were no fans there last year, they weren't permitted the Blue Jays were able to take all that space and uh, use it for the players into home weight rooms and uh, batting cages. So again, using really every inch of the park in order to spread players out and, uh, and make it into a major league facility. This is the elevators that I showed in the first uh, few pictures. If you took those up, you would come out at the pub at the park dining room, which is the main restaurant for the stadium that was turned into the, the Blue Jays team kitchen. Uh, this is a photo that I took just beyond the right field fence. There's a, a parking lot and uh, they built these buildings out there, this big white buildings and then, and then some other smaller buildings uh, for the visitors and the visitors clubhouse out there and, and all the visitors facilities in order to spread out more. This picture, after the games, you would see the, the visiting team going out through, out through the outfield and through the outfield wall. This is the New York Mets here. And you can see uh, the, all the new buildings that they put out there for the visiting team. And this is what it looked like in, the, in that big uh, white tent that was in right field, the visiting clubhouse entrance and hallway. That's where the visiting locker room was and, and the manager's office. And uh, I've heard that uh, one of the ways they were able to put this building together so quickly was that it was actually uh, designed for the Field of Dreams game that they were going to play in Iowa, but because that was canceled, uh, I don't. I'm not sure if they used some of the materials from that or if they just used the design for it. But uh, that's where the idea kind of came from for all this for the visitors' facilities. Again, the visiting facilities out in right field, the team gym. Another thing that they had to do quickly in that 18 day time frame was upgrade the stadium lighting. Uh, it wasn't up to major league specificities. So they had to change all the lights in the park. And they also brought in 
portable lights, which again, I believe were from the Field of Dreams site. They put one tower, they were on, on these trucks. There was one in left field, and then there was one in right field down the, uh, down the lines to add extra lighting in order to, to bring them up to the MLB specificities. And again, you can see here the, uh, the blue coverings, kind of the blue theme as opposed to the, the green that was there before. Um, another thing that they did in that short period was they resodded the entire infield and that went even out, I think 15 to 20 feet into the outfield, they also resodded. So they got a completely new infield and, and part of the outfield out of that. This is another good picture for seeing those auxiliary uh, bullpen. This is down the first baseline. Um, I'm out in right field taking this. Uh, you can see the auxiliary bullpen and the auxiliary dugouts that are there. And then this, of course, is the first baseline. I mean, third baseline. You can see the same thing with the, uh, with the blue and the dugout and the bullpen. This is a shot of the auxiliary, the Blue Jays auxiliary dugout on the third baseline. And then I zoom in on uh, Derek Fisher, who uh, just so that you can see how they had the seats covered there so that again, players would be spaced out more than they normally would be because of the pandemic. This is the visitor side and you can see uh, the, that picture on the left is the Baltimore Orioles when they were here and there. And then I love the picture on the right, uh, Pete Alonzo of the New York Mets is sitting, he actually moved kind of outside of the uh, auxiliary dugout and he's kind of sitting among the cardboard fans. I just thought that was a cool picture. The Blue Jays bullpen out in left field. And then as many or most stadiums had last year, they brought in cardboard fans. Uh, the West Jet flight deck that you see here pictured in right field, uh, that's normally called the Bully Hill party deck when the Bisons are here. But like I said, they even changed all the advertising and stuff on the outfield walls and, and to Canadian advertising. And uh, they changed the, the Bully Hill party deck into the West Jet flight deck, which is what it's called at the Rogers Center. The Rogers Center has uh, has an area out in center field that uh, you, you can stand at and there's a bar there and you can stand and watch the game. And so they put cardboard fans out there and made it uh, the same as it is at the Rogers Center. The honored numbers for the Blue Jays, uh, the, the picture on the left, that would normally be the press box at a Bison's game. Uh, for the Blue Jays, they did not use that as a press box because they put the press down on the, on the first level in outdoor seating so for safety reasons. Um, but they had the retired numbers up there of Roberto Alomar, Roy Halladay, and of course, Jackie Robinson. And then number one in the outfield wall to honor Tony Fernandez who passed away last year. A common sight uh, every game was players walking through the stands, which obviously you wouldn't see under normal situations. But the quickest way for both the home team and the visiting team to be able to get to the concourse level to use the batting cages was to walk up through the stands and, and kind of cut through the stands and the cardboard fans to get back to the concourse and use the batting cages. So you would often see uh, players who were the designated hitters that day uh, go, cutting through the stands to use the batting cages during the game. And there's Pete Alonzo and, of course, Vladimir Guerrero Jr. The Bisons have a, a tradition of when a player hits a home run to right field and it goes over uh, that West Jet flight deck that I was just showing and lands in the parking lot out there, they paint a white ball on the parking lot and then put the player's name and the date that he hit it there. Uh, 
Rowdy Telez hit one there as a as a Buffalo Bison as a minor league player, and then he became the first player as a major leaguer to hit one out there as well. Um, it was a 429 foot shot out there for for his major league home run, and he became only the third player to have multiple home runs out there, joining Russell Brannion and Brad Snyder. And rather than paint his Blue Jay home run in white, as all the other ones are, they put it in blue to represent the Blue Jays and, and show that it's different than the other ones. Here are a bunch of Salem Field Major League Firsts. Um, most of them are from the first game on August 11th, um, except for the triple that came a few weeks later. Uh, Hyunjin Ryu, the Blue Jays ace, started that first game against the Marlins. Jonathan Villar was the first batter, and he was also the first strikeout. Uh, Travis Shaw recorded the first hit, and he also won the game that night. Uh, the Blue Jays ended up beating Miami five to four in the 10th inning on uh, Travis Shaw's bases loaded single. So the pictures there of Ryu and Shaw at Salem Field. It was kind of cool too, like the, the visiting teams coming in, um, a lot of them had played in Buffalo before, but not recently. Uh, the Blue Jays last time, or the only time they played in Buffalo before this was in 1987 when they played an exhibition game against Cleveland at our old stadium, War Memorial Stadium, which is famous as being the New York Knights stadium in the natural movie. Um, they played Cleveland at an exhibition game, exhibition game there. The Red Sox last played in Buffalo, and this was Bill Nolan's uh, great research that came up with this. July 6th, 1917 was the last time they played an exhibition game here against the Bisons. The Phillies, I have an asterisk by this one because the last official game they played in Buffalo was in 1885, but the Bisons were um, affiliated with the Phillies in the late 50s, early 60s. So I have a feeling they, they might've played an exhibition game here during that time, but their last official game was against the National League Bisons back in 1885. The Yankees last played here in an exhibition game against the International League All-Stars in 1963. The Bisons were affiliated with the Mets uh, a few, a couple times, but last time the Mets were here were in 1965. The game was called after two innings because of rain, but the Mets had played here in 63 as well. Orioles, Rays, and Marlins, it was all their first time here. And it was really a thrill to see the stars from the visiting teams come in. Uh, Garrett Cole, who I don't have pictured here, and Jacob deGrom both pitched at Salem Field, you know, two of the, certainly the best pitchers right now. And, and you had stars like Aaron Judge and Giancarlo Stanton. And uh, this picture, which really gives you a nice view of the field again, is Bryce Harper's at the plate for the Phillies in this one. You can see him up on the scoreboard there as well. So just seeing these stars come in, you know, to a place that hasn't had Major League Baseball in so long was incredible. Unfortunately, fans couldn't be there to see it, but they could uh, get it on MLB Extra Innings and stuff and watch it that way. And this is a quote, uh, again, from Kevin Biggio, uh, who played here with the Bisons and then was here last year with the Blue Jays. So he really understood how different the stadium was and, and all the changes and uh, care that the Blue Jays put into it to make it a major league facility. And uh, again, a lot of praise from a lot of the Blue Jays players about uh, the transformation that was made. These photos all from Salem Field, I think just kind of the sign of the times from 2020. Um, Players wearing masks, of course, that's Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and, and Jonathan Villar, who, if you remember, he was the first batter uh, for the Marlins in the first game here, but he was traded to the Blue Jays at the deadline, so he was on the Blue Jays then. 
uh, Dominic Smith of the Mets. You, you would see, you know, Black Lives Matter. They had a big sign on the outfield wall the whole season. And of course, players wearing t-shirts and stuff during batting practice. And then you would occasionally see a, a player take a knee during the national anthems. That's John, uh, Giancarlo Stanton there with the Yankees. So just kind of a, a really a picture of uh, the year 2020 that that made it unique. Home field advantage, you know, the Blue Jays didn't know how the field would play for them coming in. They really did remarkably well here. Uh, they went, they won that first night and they ended up going 17 and nine <coughs> during their stay here in Buffalo. Um, they had four walk-off wins. Uh, the photo, uh, the big one there is uh, Randall Gritchick after hitting a walk-off home run against the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, you can see Teoscar Hernandez on the bottom right there, uh, giving a high five after one of his walk-off hits won a game. Um, but they had great success here going 17 and nine. So all the, the money and changes that they put in paid off for them. But no win for them was as big as the one on September 24th when they beat the New York Yankees 4-1 to one to clinch a playoff berth and celebrate on the Salem, at Salem Field. And again, as somebody who grew up uh, a Blue Jays fan, this was really a surreal experience to see them beat the New York Yankees, first of all, and then right here in Buffalo and, and celebrate on the field to to go to the playoffs, um, unbelievable. There really wasn't uh, any sign of a, a Bison logo or anything around the park. It was completely transformed into the Blue Jays, but this is just kind of a funny little thing that the Bisons did. Uh, they have what they call the WCC race, which stands for Wings, Cheese, and Carrots race. If you think of the uh, the uh, pierogi races in Pittsburgh or the sausage races in Milwaukee or the president races in Washington. We, of course, race chicken wings because we're Buffalo and their uh, their side foods like uh, carrots and celery uh, was a fan favorite until she retired. Um, but they were peeking out of one of the Bison's offices onto the field and uh, holding up a Bison sign every game. So that was just kind of a, a funny little thing to see there. And I talked about all the Salem Field first. This was uh, just, I like this picture. It's the last pitch thrown of uh, the Blue Jays 2020 stay at Salem Field. Uh, the pitcher on the mound is uh, Cesar Valdez of the Baltimore Orioles, who ironically enough is a former Buffalo Bison. Uh, the catcher, Chan Sisko, and the batter, Joe Panic. But that's the last pitch of the 2020 season. And really, you know, I left it off to be continued as a question. Um, the Blue Jays have announced oh, that they still can't get across the border because of the pandemic. They've announced that they're going to stay in Dunedin at their spring training facility until May 2nd, um, play games there. But um, their president and CEO, Mark Shapiro, uh, really made clear in his comments to the media that Buffalo is still in play and uh, that, you know, once you hit that May period when the weather starts heating up in Florida and uh, frequent thunderstorms down in Florida at that time and that they may take a, a three a three pronged approach, I think he called it, where they start out in Dunedin, then perhaps come to Buffalo and then when they are able to cross the border again, hopefully plays games in Toronto again. Um, but when Mark Shapiro made those comments to the media, he also talked about how he would like some of the changes to, to the stadium to be more permanent um, than like the temporary stuff that was in right field there that I was showing you. And uh, he talked about moving the bullpens permanently off the field was one example that he gave. And of course now, um, as of right now, uh, New York State's allowed to have 10% of uh, capacity at, at stadiums and arenas. So uh, there's a possibility that if they do come here again this year, that fans might be able to be there. 
um, if if that's so, then they would have to all that stuff they had in the concourse area, the batting cages, and the uh, weight rooms and stuff would have to be moved someplace else. So if they do come here this year, it will undoubtedly look very different on how they have it set up. Um, but it certainly is a possibility and, and Buffalo's in play to have a, a part two to this PowerPoint for 2021. So again, I thank you for having me here today. That concludes my presentation. So I'll throw that, throw it back over to you guys as soon as I can stop sharing here. Now it's just getting funky on us. I, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, thank you, Brian. That was a be above and beyond. That was great. That was thank you. Um, I'm going to cheat and kick it off from one question of my own, and then I will let other people uh, chime in with whatever questions they have. And I guess the, the, the first question that came to me is, and you may have answered this, but did the Blue Jays pay for all of this? Were there any expenses on the Bisons or was it strictly the Blue Jays picked up the cost? My understanding is there was no, uh, the Bisons didn't pay uh, for anything. The local governments didn't pay for anything. It was all the Blue Jays paid for everything, all the costs, yeah. Okay. I have a, I have a question. Yeah. Um, Alan Reefman. Um, yeah. I'm holding up this book, um, Miracle in Buffalo, How the Dream of Baseball Revived the City. Um, I, I lived in Buffalo from 1991 to 1997. Mm -hmm. That was a few years after the opening of Pilot Field, but um, you know, I, I would go to a few games every year and really loved it there. Um, another nice feature that I want to mention was how, even though the, the subway slash light rail in Buffalo does not have a great reputation because it I think it only covers like six miles. Yeah. It, it 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 takes you right up to the ballpark. And then if you know if you stay on like one or two stops further, um, you know, it would go to what was then the Buffalo Memorial Auditorium for hockey and then you know the new arena. So it was really a a nice um, setup. I just want to know if you know I just want to make sure that the speaker was um familiar with this book. It was written by Anthony Violante of the yeah. uh, Buffalo Buffalo News and um, my impression, I guess this will be my question, is that after those first several years of getting a million um, attendance, did the novelty wear off? My recollection seemed to be that, you know, it did tail down um, after the first few years. Yep. Yeah, you're, yeah, I do know that book. That's a great book. Um, I love it. And uh, I also, the I, during uh, the early 90s, I went to Canisius College. So we used to hop on the light rail that you were talking about and go down to the odd to a game or to, or to pilot field to see a game as well. So yeah, that's, um, I, I think you're right that the novel, some of the novelty did wear off. Um, I, I think that happens with any new stadium, you know, I think the same thing, uh, like I said, being a Blue Jays fan, when the Sky Dome opened that sold out night after night, year after year, and until, you know, everybody had kind of seen it and, and been there, and then their, their attendance kind of went down. Um, so I think there is a lot of it as a novelty of a new stadium that people pack in. I also think, like, the entertainment choices have, have really kind of diversified over the years. Um, we have the, um, you know, back at that time in the early 90s, if you're familiar with Buffalo, there wasn't a lot going on down at the waterfront. Whereas now they're having like concerts there at least once a week and sometimes more than that. And, and there's just a lot more kind of going on in the city. And so I think that kind of contributes to, to not having as big a crowds too. But definitely, as you said, the, the novelty of a new stadium, I, I think that can't be beat anywhere for, for getting attendance up. So I agree with you, yeah. Thank you. Yep. I think we got a, another question in the chat room. Are, are the finances for Buffalo good? Would MLB lend Buffalo dollars if the team suffers more financially in 2021? 
Well, I think their finances are good. They have, uh, we have great owners here and in, in Bob and Mindy Rich. Um, I think all minor league baseball is, is probably suffering a little bit right now because there was no season last year. And uh, hopefully there will be a season this year. They're certainly planning on, on there being one. Um, but if there is, you're probably going to have limited attendance at games. So, you know, uh, I think as far as like the team overall goes, we're in, we're in solid ground because we have great owners and, uh, you know, great tradition here. But I think, you know, for every minor league team right now, uh, it's a concern as far as, as cash flow because you lost a whole season of ticket revenue, of advertising. <laughs> so that, that is an issue, yeah. Oh, another, another question uh, in uh, who was Salen? Who was? You know, that oh, that's a great question. Yeah, uh, Salen is. If you're from Western New York, you you would know Salen. They're a uh, a meat packing uh, processing uh, company, and they're known for Salen hot dogs. Like if you get a hot dog in in Western New York, it's most likely a Salen hot dog. It's it's a very well known local company around here. Um, so yeah, Salen is a, is a hot dog, a meat packing company. Oh God, what a perfect sponsor for a ballpark. <laughs> it really is as, as far as the, for a number of reasons, one for the hot dog, uh, which is, you know, associated so closely with baseball, but also just that it's such a, a local company that, that local people know about. And it's such a, uh, a big deal in Buffalo. So it's really a perfect sponsor for the field. Okay, I'm not seeing any other in the chat club. But another, another question I have, Brian, is because I'm not, you know, I've never been in Buffalo. I think I passed by it once in my entire yeah. life on the road. Where, like, okay, I, I won't do all of it, but let's say for where the the Buffalo National League team, I should have looked this up on your site, but where would they have played in relation to where Salem failed with like, was that also downtown somewhere or cause I, I, I always get curious. I see like when, when I study ballparks, a lot of cities I notice like, like from the 1800s, like once an area endeavors itself to be a area of hosting baseball more than once, you will find that like the next parks are very close to the original area where the, you know, yep game was played so. yeah, that's a great question the National League Bisons actually they, they would didn't play in that area uh, they played on uh, what you would call probably the west side of Buffalo today originally they played at a, a park called Riverside Park um, and then after that they played not, not right downtown kind of out just a little bit at the corner of Richmond and Summer at a place called Olympic Park but Buffalo had one area where baseball was played for a long time, um, best known for being the site of Offerman Field at the corner. I'm, I'll say this for people who might be familiar with Buffalo at the corner of Michigan and East Ferry. Um, that's where the Bisons played from at, at a couple different stadiums from 1889 until 1960. Um, they originally played at a, a stadium called Olympic Park there. And then eventually a new stadium was built called Bison Stadium, which would have its name changed to Offerman uh, Field eventually. And they played there till 1960. So what you're saying about, you know, a team playing in a similar area, yeah. I think that's probably the similar area there when they played at Michigan and East Ferry. Uh, they played there for decades. And then um, eventually they would, moved to War Memorial Stadium, which was affectionately nicknamed the Rock Pile. And that's where The Natural was filmed at. That's probably what it's best known for. The Buffalo Bills played there when they first started out. Um, and then that, that was, I'm sure, a, a fine facility in its day. But unfortunately, when the, when the Bisons were there in the uh, early or late 70s, early 80s, it had kind of uh, was past its day. It was kind of falling apart. So when they wanted to uh, ex get an expansion team, they really needed a, a new stadium. And that's when they got the idea to put it right downtown. And uh, so that's that's where the, the Salem Field coming right downtown came in. Okay. 
couple of more questions here. Uh, oh, well, first I'll read the first one first. You know, are you, uh, would you be willing to speak to other Sabre chapters by Zoom and how can we get in touch with you? And uh, maybe what I could do, I mean, you can, we can do that separate if anything, I, I can put you in touch with, write to me. Uh, yeah, I, I'd love to. And you can, if you look at my, uh, my uh, Gmail is herdchronicles at gmail.com. And if you go to my website, the Herd Chronicles, um, you can contact me on there too. Um, my, I believe my Gmail's on there as well. So absolutely I would. Yeah, you can contact me that way. Uh, or you can talk to Richard and get it from him as yeah, well. Yeah, either way. Yeah. yeah. So, and then will Buffalo ever be in con the conversation for the future of any possible MLB expansion? What's your feeling? You know, yeah, a lot of people asked me that last year when the Blue Jays were coming here when I thought, you know, there might be another major league uh, team coming here. And, and I just don't see it happening. Um, I think then probably the We've tried before. We tried in like the 60s too, and the uh, ex Montreal and San Diego, I think, got the teams at that time. We, we tried to get an expansion team then. You can even go back to when the American League first formed in, in 1901. Uh, Buff Dan Johnson, the American League commissioner, told Buffalo that we'd be getting a team, and then he kind of switched it at the last minute and put the team in Boston, which became the Red Sox, and so we missed out there. But trying for the team in the 90s I think that's kind of when baseball's finances really exploded and salaries went up so and um, with the size of the city and the surrounding area I, I really don't see it because of, of the finances of baseball and stuff I think we're probably just too small mm -hmm. to attract an expansion team or bring a team here now so I think uh, that's probably behind us at this point. Okay, uh, we're going to be ending soon, but I mean, the questions are flying in now, so I'll throw a couple more here, because uh, I think they're good and they're quick. Uh, yeah. How did, uh, you mentioned how, you know, how the Bison players felt about playing in Buffalo. How did other Blue Jay players and their opponents feel about playing in Buffalo? Were there comments beyond former Bisons? Yep, I, I think, especially for former players who uh, played here for other minor league teams, they were very complimentary because they saw all that went into it. Um, the only like negative comments that I really heard uh, came from the New York Yankees when they were here. Um, Adam Adovino, the, the pitcher, uh, complained about not being able to see the catcher's signs. Um, he said it was a little too dark, but I think those were kind of comments that were made in the heat of the moment because he had a really, I think it was the Blue Jays had a 10 run inning. Yeah. Uh, and he was kind of the primary pitcher that inning. I don't think he gave up all 10 runs, but so I think he was kind of frustrated after the game when he said that. I don't know if he really, uh, really meant it or not, but I didn't really hear any other complaints that was well, all it, it, positive. It, it, it didn't sound like his pitches were making it as far as the catcher anyway. So no, no. Fine. I don't think the sign was a problem tonight. I think he was just frustrated. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, there was one other here that I thought was really good. Oh, this this is the one that I uh, – if the Blue Jays do, in fact, play the games in Buffalo in 2021, even for a while, how does that affect the Bisons, or are they still trying to work that out? <laughs> that is a great question, and I – Mark Shapiro was asked that, uh, the president and CEO of the Blue Jays, when he was giving his press conference. And he's, he's uh, I don't know if he came right out and said it or just suggested that the, I, I thought maybe the Bisons would play, say, in the mornings and the Blue Jays would play in the evenings. But he, he said there wouldn't be a sharing of the stadium, that uh, the, the Blue Jays would find a good place for the Bisons to play besides Salem Field. And I don't have any inside information on this or, or anything like that, but Rochester, uh, where the Rochester Red Wings play, they're currently the AAA yeah. affiliate of the Washington Nationals. Um, they're only a little over an hour away from downtown Buffalo and their schedule is completely opposite from the Bisons this year. When the Bisons are home, they're on the road when the red and, and it's a completely opposite. So I don't know if that seems to me like that's probably done intentionally, 
and that maybe that might be where the Bisons would play if the Blue Jays are here for a certain amount of time. Um, the other concern with that too is if the Blue Jays do come here, like I said, Mark Shapiro said he wants to make it more of a permanent solution, move the bullpens, do certain things. So the Blue Jays would need time to do that as well. So it would be, I think, hard for the Bisons to play here and have fans in and stuff while they're trying to make those changes at the field. So it, they haven't said anything about that yet, but I think it could be Rochester maybe if, uh, if the Blue Jays do come here. Yeah, uh, let's see. Yeah, thank you. And I'm going through and it looks like that's almost, I, I think the other thing here, just there's a note here from Kevin Johnson who says that they, they've identified about 25 Negro League games in Buffalo at Offerman Stadium. So it comes down to if, if MLB includes the 1949 NLC, NLA season, there will be, a, oh, there will be a few more, but there's, there's definitely some games that are, yeah. you know, were played. That's what this note is saying. So I have some just for Kevin too. I have some clippings from uh, yeah. games back then and box scores and stuff like that. And not too many box scores, but if you need anything like that, get in contact with me because I'd love to know what games you have, if you have all the ones I have, or kind of see what's yeah. going on there. Because I have some as well from that time. Great. And the only question I think I missed is, does Salem pay tribute to any of the previous Buffalo MLB or ML, uh, minor league baseball teams? Like, is there any, I know your website does, but you know, is there yeah. anywhere in the park that does that? Right when you enter the park, there's a room there that's the Hall of Fame room. And they have uh, plaques on the wall for Buffalo Baseball Hall of Famers, which a lot of those guys are, are in the Buffalo Baseball Hall of Fame. And then there's displays as well of uh, old scorecards and uniforms and stuff like that in the Hall of Fame room. And they're uh, recognized there and, uh, you know, some memorabilia. I think their scorecard from the NL team is wow. usually in there. So, yeah, there's some interesting things in the Hall of Fame room. Cool. Okay, I, I, it looks like that's everything. Uh, the uh, contact information was posted in the chat. So people can look at that if they don't want it as far as, you know, and the herdchronicles.com or Twitter at Herd Chronicles. There's a lot of ways to get a hold of Brian and yep. if you can't get a hold of him there. Just contact me. I'm the Saber newsletter editor and I'll refer you. But uh, thank you very much, Brian. I appreciate Thank the you. time, appreciate the work you put into this. And if I'm interpreting this right, a, a shout out to the Toronto Blue Jays because I get the feeling they let you use those photos. Yeah, that lots of lots of great photos from them showing the before and after as well. Yeah, so uh, yeah, because that, that was one of the things we were wondering about that that's great. It was, that was sensational, really enjoyed it. So, Thank you. And I, I think with that, uh, we can close the meeting here. I don't know unless people want to chat or something, but otherwise that's kind of, I think that kind of does it. I uh, just had one very brief mention that um, there's a person named John Boutet. I think it's B-O-U-T-E-T -E who has a Facebook group, the Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame. I think he even like, you know, like has a house full of Buffalo memorabilia, but that's another vehicle. If you're on Facebook, uh, the Buffalo Sports Hall of Fame it's not just baseball, but it's all sports. But that that's another great way to keep in touch with the history of Buffalo sports. Yes, you are correct. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. Well, thank you all. I uh, think we'll be signing off here. Good luck. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks for everything. I appreciate it. Bye. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Bill. Really wonderful. No problem. Absolutely. Glad it worked out. Yeah, so, sure. and then as soon as the video sends over to me, I'll get it over to Jacob and we'll post it on uh, the website. Great. 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 People enjoy this. Thank you. Yeah, that was fantastic. Absolutely. We'll be in touch. Thank Absolutely. You. Have a good one. And the newsletter will be ready tomorrow. So. Wonderful. Thank Excellent. You. Have a good night. Good night.